Um, so who has a wellness goal or has had a wellness goal in the past? Anybody? Can you name what would be a goal that you've had? Yeah. Stay alive. That's a good one. Well, hopefully I'm going to give you some information to keep that going as long as possible. <laughs> Why is it so challenging? Like when we have these goals, we have the greatest intentions and then it's really why it's challenging, right? You know, to get them to, you know, you run up into all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, challenges of maintaining them or figuring out how to actually implement them. Um, I have a theory that it's actually not my theory. It's actually a, a concept that um, Sigmund Freud came up with and it's called pain versus pleasure. And that everyone makes these choices on a daily basis about avoiding pain and getting pleasure. And it's the simplest thing, right? Um, and so we make these choices and I'm just gonna give you a, a quick story unrelated to health. Um, so before I became a health coach, I worked in corporate America for years. I chased the money dragon for years. Um, I was always interested in health, but um, wasn't really able to uh, uh, pursue it at that time. Anyway, I traveled all over the globe. As, you know, unfortunately, I can't say that I've seen all the wonderful sites because I was so focused on my job. I'd get to that location and work. But I had a lot of expenses, a lot of expenses. And for years, this even goes back to before I was been married and I've been married for a number of years, I hated doing expense reports. Absolutely. Has anyone ever had to do an expense report? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you'll learn from what I learned. Uh, <laughs> Um, I just hated doing them. And they, you know, I'm embarrassed to say they were not a priority for me. So I would go late and I worked for a financial services industry that created cards. Um, and I go late on my corporate card. All I had to do is do my expense report and they would pay the bill for me. But I didn't do that because I wanted to go out and meet my customers and get to the places that I had to go. So my account would go past due and it would go 30 days and it would go 60 days and they'd threaten suspension and then they'd threaten cancellation. And then I would take the money out of my savings account and I would pay the corporate card bill and say, I'm going to do my expense report next week. I eventually, it would get so painful for me that it would be a pleasure for me to do that expense report and get it off my back. So that's an example of pain versus pleasure. And I'll take it a little step further and just say that this went on for years, I'm embarrassed to say. Um, I got married, continued to travel and play this game. I would lose receipts. By the time I did my expense reports, I didn't know what that receipt was for. Maybe that was a personal receipt and I forgot about it. So I wouldn't expense it. Um, and my husband just said to me one day, he said, what, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? I was like, what, what do you mean? And he's like, you are risking so much. You're risking our financial security. You're risking our vacation by doing this. This is like ridiculous. And I, I didn't, I had never really, I know it sounds kind of silly, but I hadn't really thought about it. And I realized how upset he was. Now that did not change my behavior. I did put a goal in place and said, I'm gonna get better at this. I'm gonna get better, get a little better. And then I'd fall back into my old habits. And I was on a train one day with a guy that I worked with and we got on the train. I had just hired him the month before. So I was doing a lot of traveling, getting him acclimated. And all of a sudden we, we get on the train and all of a sudden he pulls out this little Ziploc bag and he's got this little stapler in it and this little thing of tape and all this paper. And he took out his receipts and he started taping them to these pieces of paper. I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm just getting all my paperwork ready so that I can do my expense report when I get home. So I get reimbursed for what I'm supposed to get reimbursed for. And I was like, wow, that, that looks like a great system. And he's like, yeah, I don't know why you do what you do, you know? And so we went out that afternoon, we picked up some Ziploc baggies, got me a little mini stapler and some tape and I put some white paper. And what I did is I put that in my briefcase and that went all over the globe with me. It went everywhere. And I started this habit, either when I got on the plane or when I got on the train, I'd pull out my little baggie and I, if, even if I didn't put it all together there, I put all my receipts in there. And I like to think that it saved my marriage because it was at a point where my husband was like, you know, we were putting a down payment on, uh, you know, to a vacation home. And he was like, what, what, what do you mean? Where, where's the money in the savings account? Like, this is crazy. So anyway, I tell you that story because we're going to come back, not to the story, 
but some of the behavior that I just talked about and what happens. And I will apply it to health, but I thought I would share that with you because I think it's important. It proves a point that sometimes we have to do things to really increase the pleasure of something that is a painful step for us to do. So I leave you with that um, and understanding your why. So my why was the relationship with my husband, right? Is I put that at risk. I realized how upset he was about it. And I figured I really needed to do something about it. So that was the why that I had. And the other was making something simpler and easy and accessible for me to do. So, um, and, 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 you know, getting a sense of accomplishment of actually getting it done. So today we're going to focus on that and how you can make some changes in your life or adopt new habits. And this applies to anything in your life, quite frankly, um, that I think makes it makes really makes a difference. Um, so Elaine introduced me as a personal growth and wellness coach. This is my second career. Um, I've had a very wonderful career in corporate America for many, many years and had the opportunity to pursue this, which has always been my love. Um, and so I really focus on these six pillars of health. I believe it's important to have great relationships, have joy in your life, find ways to be more mindful, get some movement, get good sleep, and have some good nutrition and hydration. And I'm going to focus on four of these tonight. Um, as we go throughout this, please feel free to ask me any questions. I'm going to take you on a little bit of a roller coaster ride. So I talked about pain versus pleasure, right? And the whole idea of this is to build, I'm going to build a little bit of pain with you and talk about these subjects and say, what happens when you don't pay attention to them? And then I'm going to give you some information and some tips of some things that you can do that are fairly simple, but it's a question of how you then build them into your habit. And then towards the back of this, we'll talk more about the execution of that information, right? So I'm going to talk about all four of those things, and then we'll get into the habits. We'll talk about some mindfulness, and we'll do some wrap up, and throughout we'll do some Q&A. Make sense? Sound good? Okay. Um, I thought this was kind of interesting. So these are the top five resolutions that happen every year in the United States, right? All of them, except for one, is really focused on um, wellness, right? You know, everyone wants to get in shape. They want to lose weight. They want to drink less. They want to get more sleep and they want to get more organized with their life. Um, and unfortunately, about 80% of people by February have abandoned these goals. And we talked about earlier about once you have some of these goals, it's so hard because you've got the best intentions. You're like, I really want to lose weight or I really want to get organized, but you don't really know where to start, right? Um, or if you, you know where to start, you're not really sure how to build it into your life. And so after a couple of days or a week and you, you've had a couple of things that are not successful, you start to abandon them. So unfortunately, this is a real statistic. Um, the only thing, and I, I was one of those people, I, I did this for years, trust me. Um, <laughs> and um, the only thing that I have this year that is my, it's not even a resolution, but it's a focus that I personally have is mindfulness. That's something that I just have been building into my, my life and we'll talk about that. So you have handouts, okay? Just really quickly, I'm not gonna go through each of these. The first one over here is just for you to take some notes on it. Now, I'm gonna share a lot of information with you. I don't expect you to write all this down, but if you hear something that I say and you're like, that's an interesting idea or that appeals to me, write it down and we can talk about it later or it might be something that you say, I'm interested, but maybe not interested today or maybe a week from now you'll revisit it and you'll become more interested in it. So just listen to some things, and if it appeals to you, you can write it down there. Um, this is something about your goals. So if you have one to three goals, I wouldn't recommend that you have any more than that, quite frankly. Um, what's really important is to understand the why. And I talked about that earlier with my example, is understanding why was it important for me to do my expense reports. Didn't seem that much at first, but when I realized how much money I was probably losing and the fact that my husband was ready to leave me, it became a goal for me and it became a motivation for me to do something about it. But going through the process, what you'll notice in this sheet is it says, what's your why? Why is this important to you? And then it says, okay, if you write something down, well, why is that important to you? 
and then ask your, answer that and then ask it again. And the intent of this is to build up that motivation to really understand why it is so important for you to make a change, whether that's not drinking as much, whether that's sleeping every night for one more hour, whether that's eating more vegetables. Really ask why is that important? Because you want to going to come back to that, especially on the days that you really don't want to eat these vegetables or you don't want to go for that walk. The one on the bottom is habit statements and habit stacks. I'll talk about that. And then I did give you a healthy habit tracker. I'm a believer, we have all kinds of trackers that you can do on your phone, but I'm a believer in visual reinforcement, right? The more you see it and the more that you see that your behavior is changing, the more you feel better about yourself and the more, the more um, excited you are to do it again. You can see that you're actually doing something, you're becoming something different than what you were before. And over time, this is what defines you. So those are the worksheets. I also have a couple other handouts on mindfulness that if you're interested, there are some great practices there. Um, and uh, we'll revisit these a little bit later. But now I'm gonna build a little bit of the pain and I'm just gonna talk about, we'll start with nutrition, but I'm gonna talk about chronic disease. Everybody knows what chronic disease is. Um, it is the leading causes of death and disability. And there is uh, six in 10 have chronic disease. Um, four people out of 10 have two or more diseases. And a lot of people don't even know that they have this disease unless they go to the doctor and all of a sudden they find out that their blood sugar is over 10. Or they find out that they, in the last year, have gained 15 pounds and their insulin is out of whack. Or, you know, a, a number of things. It just all of a sudden creeps up on you. And um, it is a problem. And nutrition is one of the biggest things that you can do to affect it. The reality is, and I was saying this earlier, is there's so much information. I'm not going to share with you anything tonight that is like brand new. I mean, it might be new. You might have said like, oh, I haven't heard that before. But you can get access to anything that I'm providing with you today. The reality is we are so overloaded and burdened with information, um, but we're getting sicker. Um, people are getting sicker every single year. Diabetes is happening in kids. There's reasons why these things are happening. Um, all these different diseases. And a lot of it stems from the way that we eat, right? That's one of the ways. There are other things that we'll talk about. But I, I stole this picture from, I'm not really sure who. I, I'm a big believer in stealing shamelessly. Um, but I don't know who did it, so I couldn't get them credit. But I love this because this to me was, was sort of an eye opening to figure out that we really are a machine. Um, if you think about, and you really, if you studied any biology, I was not a good biology student many years ago, but I've been studying a lot more of it since I pursued this and how the body works and everything that we take in, everything that we experience makes a change in our body, either positive or negative. And so it is really important that you really think about how you're eating and how that impacts. Now, I'm not gonna tell you that you, all the things that you shouldn't do and that you should never have potato chips again. I'm not about that. Um, but there are some things that we've talked about that are good habits to include to make sure that when you do have that piece of cake or uh, you know, a piece of candy, that it doesn't upset your whole system and become a whole different habit that you have to avoid. So um, processed food, what's a processed food? Potato chips, what? It doesn't. Okay, yep. Well, it might have started at the earth, right? It might have started there, yes. Um, yeah, so processed food is something that it's just not in its original state, right? Um, it's usually packaged, it's boxed, it's got all kinds of lists of ingredients that are in it. And it comes in a lot of different attractive, um, uh, attractive different states. Now, not all processed food is bad because really most of the food that we eat is processed. So when you go to the grocery store and you go to get some meat, that's processed, right? Someone else took care of whatever the animal was, took it apart, packaged it for you and put it out there. Now, but it's in its closest natural state. So not all processed food is bad for you. Um, frozen food is also processed. But what I'm talking about 
are these kind of processed foods that are high in sugar, um, that are no longer in their natural state. And the reality is that when they're not in their natural state, a lot of these things, your body doesn't necessarily recognize it or it shifts. It's like a, what is that? I think there's some show, it was called a shape shifter. Um, it becomes a different item in your body. And sometimes your immune system doesn't necessarily recognize it and it lets it go through the process. And then your body tries to process it and it can wreak havoc if you have too much or you repeat that same behavior over and over and over again and don't do things to go off uh, to change it. So I'm gonna talk about a, a little bit about um, why these are so bad. So one of the things about this is um, what, what people in the food industry, industry try and do is they create a bliss point in some of these things, which is really crazy, but that is a statement. They create a point where it's like, I need to have another bite. I am a one, I'm not a one Lay's potato chip kind of gal. I'm a bag kind of gal, right? But that is true is that they make these foods so that you don't want to have just one of those chocolate covered potato chips or something else, but you want to eat more. Um, they usually have way too much sugar, sodium and fat. Um, they lack the nutritional value. A lot of times you see things like fat-free foods or sugar-free, there's usually tons of chemicals in there. And um, those aren't necessarily good for you. Uh, a lot of them have a lot of calorie dense items. They're addicting. They're much quicker to digest. So when it gets into your system and it can't recognize it, it just tries, well, I got to get this out of here. So it'll go through your system. It won't just go out your system. You will absorb some of those things that are in there that are not good. And there's like about 15,000 different chemicals that go into some of these items that we start eating and it has to go somewhere in our system, right? So, um, when it does come in like that, and when it's processed that much, when it's so highly processed, it loses all of its nutri nutrients. So if it started out, it, it, it obviously did start out of a natural whole food, but by the time they process it, it's been changed so much that it's not recognizable anymore. So um, what's the result of this? The result is all these different things, cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, all kinds of things and anxiety and depression. They're really linking a lot of these things to the different types of foods that we're eating today. So that's the pain. Everyone feeling the pain associated with and some of your favorite foods that might be there. Um, so there's a couple of things that you can do, right? So I've got, you know, four recommendations and we'll talk about some other tips, but you know, some of them are increasing your consumption of whole foods. So this picture over here, the more that you can eat whole foods, the better you are. Um, and you know, you can you can get a lot of these at the grocery store. You can get them at the farmers market. Um, reduce your consumption of meat. So I'm not necessarily saying that you become vegetarian or vegan, but there is scientific evidence that says that too much red meat is not good for you. So if you do have red meat, want to think about doing it maybe once every two weeks or even less than that, right? Um, you also want to make sure that you are reducing, you know, these types of foods down. Uh, number three, uh, these really create a tremendous amount of stress on your body. And uh, last but not least, the, you know, the big bad guy is eliminate or re significantly reduce sugar. Sugar is, um, it, it is so bad for you. It's, I love it. I mean, I've got to be honest with you. I do love sugar, but it is really bad for you. And this, this is probably one area that is, uh, to me, is the biggest challenge because it's in so many great things. Even fruit, if you have too much fruit, that's not good for you. So it's really about balancing. And I'm all about balance. I'm not going to tell you never to have some ice cream or anything like that again. That's life, right? And we're here to get pleasure and avoid pain as much as possible. But um, Staying away from sugar as much as possible is probably one of the best pieces of advice that I would give to you. So what are some things that you can do? Um, so leverage the farmer's market. You guys have a farmer's market up here, I'm sure, right? Um, great stuff there. And there are some great um, processed foods that come in the farmer's market that people are making out of their homes. Well, like things like that bread, right? Um, replace white carbs with as minimally processed grains as you can. So like Brown rice is good, quinoa, I don't know if you've done it, but that's high in protein, millet, 
Um, I like to roast vegetables on a Sunday. I'll take just whatever I have, roast them, put a little olive oil, salt and pepper, put them in the oven for 30 minutes at like 400 or 350, 375 and roast them. They're great with drizzled balsamic vinegar over them or put them on a salad. Um, try a new veggie every week. There's so many different types of vegetables that are out there. Um, a great thing to do is sneak, if you're not a vegetable person, sneak them into some of the foods that you do like. So if you like tomato sauce, um, grated carrots in a tomato sauce is great and it's good for you. Uh, putting a chopped zucchini in tomato sauce is good. Um, you know, adding different types of um, mac and cheese, you can put grated carrots in. Also lasagna, you can put spinach in. There's all different ways that you can have your traditional foods that you love, but just adding a few extra vegetables in there. Um, the other thing is there's a lot more research that, that talks about changing the order of, of, the, of the way that you're eating. So it, that, that whole idea of, you know, first thing in, first thing out, it really applies to the way that you eat. So when you start to eat a food, it goes through your system that way. Your body and your stomach starts to process it. It goes into your small intestines and makes its way down there. If you're eating fiber, which is we, we eat a lot less fiber than we really should be, that slows down digestion and it also hides sugar. So if you do have sugar, it gets trapped in between the fiber and it doesn't mean that it goes away, but you can reduce the amount of sugar that gets into your bloodstream, um, which increases your insulin and so forth um, by just changing the way that you eat your food. So if you've got a plate in front of you that's got steak and it's got salad, maybe some broccoli, maybe a potato, you wanna eat the broccoli first. You wanna start with the fiber that's there and then make your way around the plate. Maybe have the salad, eat a little steak, some salad, and follow up with a potato. Um, try a meatless Monday or VB6. Everyone know meatless Mondays? It is exactly what it is, right? Um, we do that at my house. Anyone heard of VB6? So um, you have, okay. So Mark Bittman, um, he used to be the editor for the, the food editor, right? For the New York Times. And um, he actually, probably I think about eight years ago, maybe longer, he um, went to the doctor for a checkup. He was about 35 pounds overweight. He had high blood pressure. His sugar was out of control. And he said to the doctor, you know, what, 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 do you, what am I supposed to do? And he goes, you need to become vegan. And he was like, what? <laughs> like, there's no way I can become vegan. Vegan. I'm, you know, the food editor for the New York Times. I've got to go out to restaurants and try all these great things. And he said, you need to become vegan. So what he did is he created VB6, which is vegan before six. And that's the way he eats today. He eats vegan all the way up until six o'clock at night. And then if he wants to go out and have a steak, he will have steak for dinner. He might have dessert. He's very good about balancing those things, but he eats vegan before six o'clock. Um, and there's a couple books. I'm sure they're here at the library. Um, and, uh, He's been very successful with it. He lost the 35 pounds, his blood sugar is in control, and he no longer has high blood pressure. Um, so that's an option. If you, if you don't want to go fully vegan and you still want to have that steak every once in a while, this is definitely a good option. Yeah. Well, what it's just doing, it's limiting the amount of meat processed foods that he's having. And the doctor was pretty much the dairy. Those are some of the things that were big contributors to his high blood pressure and his sugar problem. So he doesn't, you know, and he would say to you, he doesn't always have steak every night, but he used to have maybe steak and eggs for breakfast. Maybe he'd have chicken in his salad. So now he doesn't do that anymore. He might have oatmeal for breakfast. He might have a salad without any meat, maybe tofu or something in it. Um, and so he, he's limited the amount of protein or meat items that he has. Make sense? Sure, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, and like I said earlier, I'm all about progress, not perfection. So if something like this rings true for you and you want some advice on how to do it or implement something like this, I'm happy to chat, chat with you about it. Any other questions about nutrition? I'm gonna move on to hydration. Good. I'll have a sip of my water. Okay. So good, some good stats for you to know, right? 
Um, this visual is really true. Our bodies are about 50 to 75% water. This decreases as we age and it becomes even more important that you hydrate. Um, and it, it, it's really critical to the way that our body runs, right? For us to maintain that 98.6 or 97.6, uh, we need to have the right amount of water to do that because it is like a cooling system and it also works as a heating system. Um, it helps nutrition work. So it helps with digestion. It helps everything in your body run and it lubricates your joints. So the older that we get and our, you know, our joints become a little bit more frail and we start losing some of the cartilage, water is really critical because it really absorbs a lot of the shock if you end up having a fall or something. So just a few, a few facts for you there. Um, and it's, you know, they're saying now that it's a common pathway that's linking disease. So um, what are some things that happen when you don't have enough water? So um, you've probably seen this before, your urine gets very dark. It can have a very strong smell to it. You can become constipated. Um, you have a much greater increase of injuries. Um, for me, I always know when I've not had enough water because I became, become very lightheaded. Um, and it's shown to have cognitive impairment. You have a harder time making a decision when you don't have enough water in your system. So let's talk about some of the things that you can do. Um, first is really drinking half your target weight in daily water. Now, some people, depending upon how much you weigh, you might be, oh my God. But really a minimum of like, you know, 50 to 64 ounces is really the, the sweet spot of really where you want to target your water. And there's a couple ideas of how you can do that. So I really make an effort as soon as I get up in the morning to have eight ounces of water when I rise, right? Because when you think about it, you go to bed at night. Um, I try and stop drinking at around six or seven because I always have to get up at night and go to the bathroom. Um, so I try and stop drinking earlier. So I try and pack in a lot before six or seven o'clock at night. And then um, when you get up in the morning, you're dehydrated. You are naturally dehydrated. You've been sleeping all night. Your body's been working its processes and it's using up the water in your system to do that. So you are dehydrated. It's the best thing that you can do to start your day um, in addition to looking at light and the sun. Uh, another way you can do it is build it in as a habit, right? Before you have <laughs> breakfast, about 15 minutes before, have another eight ounces. Do the same thing at lunch. Do the same thing at dinner. If you do have alcohol when you're socializing, make sure that you back it up with a glass of water before and after that glass of wine or that cocktail. Um, another is to keep a pitcher of water on your desk. So um, I do that at home when I'm working at home. I, it's a habit I built. I've got a clear pitcher downstairs. Every morning afterwards, I bring it back up to my office. It sits on the desk and it's a good measurement for me to see around noon if that's not halfway done. I'm really going to have to be drinking a lot of water in the afternoon. So this is something that figuring out where you can fit this into your day is a good habit to build. And we can talk how you do that. Okay. Um, any questions on water? Hydration? How about movement? Um, I'll share, you know, everybody get some sort of exercise today. Or can you share with me what you do today? Oh, wow, that's great. Run, that's great. I wish I could do that. I can't do that anymore. I don't have good knees. Anybody else? That's amazing. That is great. Very good. That's good. This is, uh, movement is really critical. Um, so I'm just going to get a couple stats here that, um, you know, you can read here. There's a lot of people that still are not getting enough exercise. Um, it is a huge weight on the healthcare system because of that, because they've proven that as we have that lack of exercise, there's so many other things that can go wrong. And we'll talk about that. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that middle stat is pretty frightening, you know, because you would think in high school, that's when you should be getting around and doing all this good stuff. And if you don't have those habits back then, it gets that much harder as you get older. Um, so, you know, it's really critical. Why is it critical? Because of osteopenia or osteoporosis, right? 
Um, it decreases the amount of total calories that you burn. It is not a weight loss solution. So uh, a lot of people say, oh, I'm just gonna exercise more and I'll lose weight. That, that's not the case. Um, it really helps with dis depression and mood swings. Um, my, my daughter suffers from uh, depression and I'm known for, uh, I can always tell and I'm like, all right, <laughs> What are we doing right now? Drop down, give me 10 push-ups, or we're gonna go for a walk or she can run, I can walk and I'll take her outside and it makes such a big difference. Um, so if you're ever feeling down and blue, this is definitely the medicine to take, a quick walk. Um, great thing about it is that if you do like dessert and you do have dessert, the best thing that you can do is go for a walk afterwards. Even 15 minutes, what it automatically does is your body starts burning that glucose so that insulin that gets into your system is not as great as it would be if you just sat in front of the TV and had a piece of cake. So there's a lot of benefits to it and it also risks your risk, it in, reduces, excuse me, your risk of disease. Um, so, and the benefits of it are numerous, right? So it's really critical to maintaining your bone health. Um, I have osteoporosis in my family. I don't have it, thank God, but I have it in my family. My grandmother had it really, really bad, um, but it does so many different things. It's great for memory and function. Um, and I just share another tidbit with you. My mom had a dog and when the dog passed, my, my mother used to walk the dog every single day, twice a day. She would religiously take the dog for a walk. The dog died about two years ago and my mom stopped walking and her brain function has decreased significantly. And I, I know it's, you know, as a result of this. So we play a lot of Rummy Cube. Do you guys know Rummy Cube? Great game, really fun. Um, it does help in weight management, but it is not the solution for it. Um, but it does help with blood pressure. It does help with the quality of your sleep. It's great if you're feeling down and blue and it does combat cancer fatigue. Um, so it's, it's really any kind of exercise. You don't have to do 10,000 steps a day. I'm not gonna say that's not good to do, but you don't have to do 10,000 steps to get the benefit of just going for a walk. So what are the things that you can do? These are just a few. The handout up here has 35 different things that you can do, but these were some of my favorite. I do the second one here, which is setting alarm on my phone so that every 30 minutes when I'm at my desk, I get up, I walk around. Sometimes I'll go downstairs, come back up again. Take an extra walk around the perimeter of the grocery store. That's the healthiest area, right? Um, use a basket instead of a shopping cart. Um, you just burn more calories doing that and get more exercise. I do push-ups on the counter. If you're at your kitchen counter, you can easily just turn over. You don't have to go all the way down to the floor and just do some light push-ups. Um, and if you still work and you have a meeting with some colleagues and you're working from home or you're going to the office, hold a walking meeting. Those are great. Um, really gets people's brain thinking and, and active. So those are some ideas for ways that you can increase your movement. And as I said, this handout here has like 35 other different suggestions that are out there if you're interested. Any questions, thoughts, comments? Advice? Okay, let's talk about sleep. Sleep, um, so underrated, so very underrated. I'm just gonna read this kind of, it's kind of small type, but inadequate sleep, even moderate reductions for just one week disrupts blood sugar levels so profoundly that you would be classified as a pre-diabetic. That's pretty frightening, right? Um, because diabetes is a very, very scary disease. Um, but this is from Matthew Walker. It's a great book, Why We Sleep, Unlocking the Power of Sleep and Dreams. So the thing about sleep is this is also really, really critical for your body. And I know you can't read all this over here, but it talks about memory issues, mood changes, accidents, high blood pressure, weight gain, greater risk of diabetes, low sex drive, um, poor balance. Uh, more than 1,500 deaths a year are caused by drivers falling asleep at the wheel. And I don't know if any of you are familiar, there's a, there's a law in New Jersey called Maggie's Law because Maggie was killed by someone who had not been sleeping in about 24 hours. So there's actually a law and they monitor this to make sure that some of those big trucks that go through actually have to take a break 
and go to sleep instead of just like driving for 24 hours straight. And I, I love this stat that not sleeping for 24 hours is equivalent to a blood alcohol level of 0 0.10, so, which is way over the legal, uh, the alcohol limit, right? Um, so that's really the bad things about sleep deprivation. These are the things that it helps us do. So the, all the things that you think about, um, you know, once we go to sleep, your body goes into this whole process of different things that it's really, it's really cleaning itself out and getting prepared for the next day, right? So a lot of things can impact that. Like if you eat dinner way too late and you go to sleep on a full stomach, you know, your whole system starts to, th those processes like digestive really start to slow down. But when you've got that food in your system, your body's like, well, I gotta, I gotta work over here instead of do the cleanup that I was supposed to do over here. So there's a lot of things that you need to think about in preparing yourself for sleep, um, but it does all these things. You know, your body goes through this like really cleaning system. It's like having the cleaning lady come over and just sweep everything up and get the bad stuff out. Um, and um, we'll talk more about hormones. You'll see this, this next slide, I, this took me forever to build. I actually did build this slide. Um, but I'm going to start us over to on the on the left hand side where the green is, because this is this is this is not you, but this is on average what a 24 hours looks like um, in terms of sleep. So if you're waking up at 6 a.m. in the morning, your blood pressure starts to rise. Melatonin, which is a critical hormone in your body, stops really producing at that point. That's what puts you to sleep. So it stops secreting that and you start big time secreting cortisol, right? To wake yourself up. Um, you probably start going to the bathroom, a bowel movement around 8.30 or so, right? Your testosterone is at its highest around nine o'clock, alertness through the day. Um, as the afternoon comes on, you're still really powered up there. You've got your best coordination, great reaction time, um, great cardiovascular strength. And then as the evening starts to come in, and you can see it's really, everything is based on light, right? Um, your blood pressure is at the highest over here. What is that? Um, is that seven or, yeah, I'm so bad with this. I should, I traveled internationally for years and I never got the 24 hour clock. Um, so, and then your, your body, as it starts to get darker, your body recognizes the darkness and it starts producing the melatonin, which starts winding your body down and getting it ready for sleep. You know, your whole systems here start to shut down. So you're not going to start going to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Um, you're going to sleep through, you're going to have like three different cycles of sleep that are going to happen through here. And it's, it's really fascinating, but light really drives it. And there's good light and there's bad light. Um, and so it's all these like the, you know, computer lights and things like this kind of light is really great at this point because it's not too bright because it's still, it's, you know, after eight o'clock at night, it's starting our, you know, our melatonin at this point is starting to rise. It's telling us like it's dark. We need to start thinking about going to sleep pretty soon. Um, so I, I love this because it, sleep is just such a, I, I mean, I know myself, I ignored it for a very long time. But these are some tips that you should think about. So coffee and tea, I love my coffee. Um, I love my tea, but um, it's not good after two o'clock. You should really stay away from caffeine at two o'clock because it really upsets that whole hormonal balance. Um, alcohol and cigarettes, if you drink, try and keep it to the earlier part of the evening. Um, try not to eat too late, at least two to three hours before you actually start laying down to go to sleep would be best. And then blue light, right? Some of the lights that we have that are out there really disrupt our brain in terms of, you know, getting, sending very mixed messages about whether we should be shutting down or waking back up again. Um, so that's why it's really good. Like if you have a phone or you have an iPad or your computer that you change the light on that or put it away maybe an hour or two before you start going to sleep. Um, exercise is really great to help you sleep, but if you do it too late, it can just wind you up. Um, I'm a big exerciser in the morning, but I'm going through a Pilates certification training program. And so I go to this class every weekend for six weeks from 2.30 till 8.30 at night. So I'm working out at eight o'clock at night. 
I come home on a Saturday and Sunday night and I am just pumped up. I can't get myself like to wind down. So I end up going to sleep about two hours later than I normally do. And I'm an early riser. So then on Monday, I'm like dragging, right? Um, so you just got to be careful with exercise. If you do a light walk, that's fine, but you don't want to be doing anything too, uh, too extreme um, in the evenings. Temperature should be about 65 degrees in your bedroom. You don't want to be too overheated. A lot of people will open up the window. I'm not one of those people. I don't like being cold, but um, that it is good to have some fresh air in the room and try and get a consistent schedule. So this is probably really important. These two things, a consistent schedule of when you're going to get up and when you're going to get down. And when you get up in the morning, the best thing, even if it's a cloudy day, the best thing that you can do is get yourself in some natural light. So as soon as you can see, even if it's raining outside, there is that natural light. It might take a little bit longer, like 15 to 20 minutes, but that starts signaling your brain to start that cortisol going and get you to wake up. Um, so try and get you know five to 10 minutes. If the sun is out there, that's the best time for you to get some light. Um, and then try and get into a consistent routine of going to bed at the same time. One of the other things is having a routine at night. So if you're someone that you're watching TV, you go up to go to bed and they're like, okay, now I got to wash my face. I got to brush my teeth. I got to take off my clothes, put on my nightgown, plan what I'm going to wear the next day. Sometimes if you do that a little bit earlier and then finish your evening, that by the time your evening is over, you can just get right back into bed. You've already brushed your teeth. You've already done those things. And so it's easier for you to get into sleep. Uh, another good thing is to meditate or just do some deep breathing exercises. You don't have to meditate for 30 minutes to get the benefits of just being quiet. Um, and so those are some things with sleep. Any comments from you? Anyone? Great sleep tips or anything? Well, um, there's a couple different ways. I did, if you took this handout, and I'm going to go over this with everyone if, um, in this next section. But um, let me, I'll go over this in this next section. We'll talk about it. So um, this, is, this is my, uh, I don't want to say it's a resolution, but it's something that I'm just really focused on this year is mindfulness and just spending more quiet time. And I, you can do it any way that you want. It might be going to church and sitting in the church if you have a church that you go to or um, you know, going to the park and sitting, just having some quiet time for yourself. It doesn't have to be for a long period of time, but just really getting, um, just getting in tune with yourself um, and just doing some breaths, some deep breathing is a great way to relax yourself. And it's been proven to really help your health. Um, so a couple things that you can do. Um, these are some of the benefits of doing it. But what this handout has is I've put together like five different things that are great practices. Um, the one is just like you can sit in an upside up, up, um, sorry, upright position. Um, or if you're lying in bed, you can lie in bed and do this, but you can just take four deep breaths. So you can breathe in through the nose and you exhale through the mouth and you can, you know, just do that. You can put your legs out in front of you, just relax. You can, um, you know, tighten the muscles in certain areas of your body and then just relax them and keep the deep breathing going. So this first one talks about just tightening certain areas and relaxing them. Um, the second one talks about um, doing some positive affirmations. So I've gotten five that are here, um, but just really doing some of those deep breaths, like taking three deep breaths and then saying like, here's one, I'm grateful that everything in life is always coming to me effortlessly and easily, all is well in my world. You can make up whatever resonates with you. Um, it's just whatever is most important to you. Um, one of the things that we do, uh, I'm a church goer and my, um, I brought my kids up to go to church, but they're now at the point where they're saying, I don't really wanna go to church anymore. So we used to always at night say grace and we do, you know, bless us, our Lord, whatever. And all of a sudden, probably, I don't know, it was about a year ago, my daughter just stopped blessing herself and saying, participating in grace. She wasn't disrespectful. She just stopped doing it. And uh, it irritated me at first. And then I 
just said, okay, well, what can I do that's a little similar, a little different that might resonate with her? And so we started a practice of saying what we're grateful for every night. And we do it every single night. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything other than, you know, I'm grateful I was able to come out tonight and my car started this morning, or I'm grateful that I had a little snack when I got here, or I'm grateful that I did that exercise that I was supposed to. So it can be anything. Sometimes we do a rose, a bud, and a thorn. Um, a rose is what was good today. Um, a thorn is what you might not have been as happy about. And a bud is what you're looking forward to. Um, but just expressing gratitude is being mindful of what you have in your life, which is good, you know, your health or anything. These are the benefits of it. And then, like I said, these are these some deep breath breathing, some saying some po positive informations, um, even eating the way that we eat. Sometimes we just kind of sit down and just like gobble up our food. And then we go on to do something else. Just taking your time to eat a little bit slower is a mindfulness act, right? And it can calm you. Um, so I would definitely recommend that you look at some of these suggestions that are up in the front. Okay, so that's the pain. Uh, hopefully I've given you some pain and I've also given you some suggestions of things that you can do. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how do you actually build in some habits, right? So um, motivation is what gets you started. Habit is what keeps you going. One of the biggest challenges when you think about New Year's resolutions is you're all gung-ho, right? I'm going to walk 10,000 steps. I'm going to make that my goal. I'm going to do that. But you don't really get to, well, how am I going to do that? What, what am I actually going to do to get those 10,000 steps in? Where is that going to fit into my day? 10,000 steps is a lot of steps. So you really got to figure out where is that going to fall within the day? And what it is, is all about building a habit around that. And so um, the worksheets that I told you about, what we're going to focus on now is the habit statement and stack. I'm just going to go over these with you and you can take these with you. And if it interests you, I, you know, um, they're great tools for you to use if you want to try something new, but I'll tell you about how it works. So um, one of the things that you want to do, so say, for example, um, let's say you want to walk 30 minutes every day. Okay. Um, what you want to do is think about what is your day like today, right? Um, where do you have time that you could fit in a 10 minute walk at three different times during the day? Or do you have a very set schedule that you can actually take a break during lunch to do that? Um, do you have the ability to do that after dinner and you're, you're motivated to do something like that? So you really need to think about what it is, where you could actually fit something in and think about how your day progresses. And then you want to connect that with an existing habit that you have right now. So for example, say you want to walk in the evening after dinner. Um, if you have a habit of having dinner and then getting up to clean the dishes, what you might want to do is maybe put the dishes in the sink, go for a walk, and then clean the dishes. Um, it doesn't have to be in that order, but you want to connect it with something else that you do all the time consistently. So you're actually banding those two habits or stacking them together, and it actually increases your ability to be more successful with it. The other thing is starting small, and you can get big results. So I'm not all about adding five new habits to your day because habits take change and we don't, are not always successful with it. So if you start out small, get some success, then you can start adding some additional habits on top of that and you'll see even more benefits. So let's just talk a little bit. So the, the tracker that you each have, or if you haven't gotten it, you can get it as you go out. This is like for... Um, three different habits. I'll show you what it looks like, but you've got your habit up here and then you've got Monday through Sunday and you've got these little dots that you just fill in when you complete the habit. And what this does is it gives you a visual clue of a behavior change. And it gives you a positive visual that you're actually making a change in your behavior. And it's an important change, right? As opposed to just putting something on your phone that you're not seeing all the time. 
So this goes somewhere where you're going to see it and you're going to see it completed. And this is what it looks like as you're completing it. So maybe you had drinking 64 ounces of water a day in there or watering your plants or walking to work or reading before bed. Maybe you will have a goal that you want to read two pages before you go to bed every night if you wanted to read you know, two books a year or something. So this is what it would look like. Um, you, you don't have to use colors. I just did this for demonstration purposes, but um, you would just track whatever that goal is. And you every day that you do it, you complete it. Now, what's um, important about this, the reason why this is important is that the more, when you're doing this, you're building evidence to prove to yourself that you're becoming a different person. Um, there's a, a story of two people that were quitting. They were both smokers and they were both quitting smoking and they were at a party and a guy came over to them and said, Hey, do you want a cigarette? And one guy said, I don't smoke. And they said, well, do you want a cigarette? And that person said, no, I'm trying to quit. And he identified himself as a smoker and that, you know, so when you identify yourself as something that you're not, it's much harder to get over it. The first guy identified himself as, I don't smoke anymore. I'm, that's who I am, that's my identity. When you track your habits and you see that you're doing these things over, you become that person that you wanna be. If that's a non-smoker or a walker or a runner or a book reader. Um, so, Having this visual clue is something that really helps. A couple other things is avoid breaking the chain. So if you start a new habit, you want to keep that streak going, right? And you want to try not to miss more than twice. So for example, say you have this walking habit, you want to walk for 15 minutes every night after dinner, and you make great progress on Sunday, on Monday, on Tuesday, and all of a sudden Wednesday comes around, and something happens, you get a phone call from your um, friend and you miss that walk. The next day you finish your dinner and you're all ready to go out for a walk and you get another phone call from someone else that you haven't talked to in a really long time. What's important is that you might not do the 15 minute walk, but walk someplace, even if it's for two minutes, walk someplace and check the box because it's that evidence thing. It's like you actually are giving yourself credit. Once you pass that two times, the next time it comes up the next day, you might be like, oh, I didn't do it for the last two days. I'm not going to do it tonight. So really try if you do any, any habit you choose, whether it's walking or anything, um, really try and not miss more than twice. And when you do, if you, if you have to, if you can't complete it 100%, just do a little of it and check off the box. You did it. You actually made that effort. Give yourself credit for it. It's really important. Okay. Um, and here's just something that this is from Atomic Habits. I'm a big believer in this. And what happens is we get these goals. And this is kind of like what I just said about the walking. This is what we think is going to happen. It's just going to get better and better and easier and easier. And it's going to be great. Um, and that happens with weight loss. It happens with reading a book. It happens with anything. But the reality is what happens is um, you, you don't always trend that way. The changes that you want to happen from doing that 15 minute walk, you might not see your blood pressure reduce right away, right? You might not see all those good healthy things or those good uh, indicators of, of, of the impact of that right away. Those things happen over time. And we get to this point where we're like, you know what, I've been doing this now for you know, a couple of weeks now and I'm still not feeling that much better. But that's when you really have to hang in there because it's those changes that over time really redefine who you are and, um, and, and get you to a point where you're more successful and it becomes a part of your identity. Um, and... I'm going to use myself as, as an example here. I started, I used to be a pretty big gym rat and um, I just got sick of going to the gym. I just, I just couldn't do it anymore. I just didn't like it. And I discovered Pilates and I thought I, you know, I'd like to exercise in the morning because once the day got away from me and I got involved in work, I wouldn't go back. 
so I, I started this and I, um, I did this habit stack and I said, after my alarm goes off, I wrote this down I, at five o'clock, I'm going to get dressed. I'm going to take the dogs out. I'm going to feed them. I'm going to make myself a cup of coffee and I'm going to go to Pilates. I do this every morning. I've been doing this for two years. I do this five days a week and I take two days off. And I'm not saying that to say, oh, aren't you wonderful? I'm just saying it, this stuff works. It really, really works. I no longer keep track of this. I did. I had a big board that showed me that I could actually do this and I could accomplish these things every single day. So these are just some other examples. Like if you wanted to start getting into the habit of making your lunch before you go to work, um, how would you do that? So what is your existing pattern today and where could you fit in making yourself a quick lunch so that you could bring it to work or bring it to the park or wherever you go to make sure that you did that as opposed to buying something at McDonald's or something like that. Um, so that's, these are just a couple examples. Um, you know, keeping the kitchen and the bedroom clean before you go to work. So this is uh, a guy that just wanted to make sure his apartment was clean. And um, he used to make his breakfast. He'd leave the dishes there. He wouldn't make his bed. And he changed his pattern, you know? So he figured out where am I going to build in this habit with something else? So he's attaching this and I've, I've highlighted these things. I'm gonna, while my breakfast is cooking, which he did every single day, he's gonna empty the dishwasher, which he didn't used to do. And then from there, he's gonna eat his breakfast and he's gonna make sure he put his dishes into the dishwasher right away, shower, get dressed, put the clothes in the hamper and make the bed and then go to work. Probably took him just a few extra minutes to do that. But the discipline of this is, is, is a plan. This is the plan that you have in place to actually build that habit into your everyday regime. So um, this is a statement. If this is, I've given you all a copy of this. This is something that you can use that really it's just a fill in the blank thing that you can use to say whatever that habit is that you want to build into it. And um, these are a couple, like if you wanted to start any one of these health habits, these are a few. So drinking water every day or adding a cup of green vegetables to your diet. There's lots of great benefits to just doing that. It's increased of fiber, right? There's all kinds of things there. Going to bed by 9 p.m. How can you incorporate that into your day? These are some of the questions that you would ask yourself, or these are the types of habits that you would be interested in doing and really figuring out how it would work into your existing schedule. So, sir, you said that every night you read a book, um, you know, that's a habit. You don't have to keep track of that anymore. You've, you've got that, you've developed that habit and it's something that you know that helps you get to sleep every night. You listen to an app that helps you do that and it's part of your habit right now. So the thing is really critical in this doing this is making it accessible and simple and easy for you to do. So you want to minimize the disruption, but incorporate it into your life in the easiest way that you can. Sometimes that's not always easy, but um, it, it is when you're starting a habit, it's important that you try and think about how you're going to build it into your day. Um, so uh, you can change your life. It doesn't, you know, what I talked about tonight, I'm talking about health, but this applies to anything in your life that you want to do, right? Um, you can change who you are. You know, you can um, build new evidence for a person that you want to become. The more that you do that, you become that person. Uh, you know, it's not just to run a marathon, it's to become a runner, right? It's, Every time you run, you become a runner. Every time you walk, you become a walker. Every time you play pickleball, you become a pickleball player. Um, so the things that you do one or two times don't define you. It's the habits that you have and you repeat over and over again that really become your identity. Um, last one, best way to change behavior is with short-term feedback. And this is the quickest way for you to get feedback on whether what you're doing and, and, and how you're progressing to it. So that comes to the conclusion. Um, like I said, I focus on these six areas. I think they're really, really important for our overall health. 
um, and finding balance in them. So not being too extreme on one end or the other. Um, life is, is fun and it's important to have all these things in your life and finding the right balance and doing good most of the time at them. So if you're interested in getting any help with any of these things, I'm more than happy to chat with you. I'm about, oh, I realize I'm just about five minutes over. Um, these are my last, last things to think about. Identify your goals, write them down, look at them every single day. Ask yourself why those are important. Take small steps, don't overdo it. Um, focus on the behavior, not the outcome initially. You'll get to the outcome, you'll get to that goal, but it's the behavior that you wanna change. Reward yourself, create a reward system. And remember that motivation is what gets you started. It's the habit that is gonna keep you consistent in your behavior. And with that, this is my information. If you wanna get in touch with me or there's cards, I wanna thank you for your attention. You've been great.